Welcome to the final part of John Cogan's series on personal productivity. We talked about time management and we talked about attention. And today, John is going to be covering energy. So, very much looking forward to what he has to say. Um, you're all aware this is the last week of the Design Exchange, um, where we'll be taking stock and uh, producing a summary of what we've learned. And look forward to sharing that with you. So, John, over to you. Thank you. As John has mentioned, this is the third part of time, attention, and energy. And as we've seen, when we manage our time well, we feel control over things that we need to do, and we tick things off on a regular basis, that itself gives us energy, gives us the impetus to keep going. And similarly, when our attention is well managed, then we're clear about what we need to do. When our attention is used well, and not, and not wasted, then that also gives us energy. So energy comes both through time and attention, but also we can manage energy separately as well. So let's look at that. So we can split our management of energy down to three areas. One is, one is our health. One is our mood, and one is our focus. And each of those can affect the energy levels that we've got. Let's look first at health. So, no brainer, eat nutritious food. There's a social contract between our, the bacteria in our intestine and our organism, and we have a, a hundred trillion bacteria in our intestine, which is ten times the number human body cells that there are. So they outnumber us 10 to 1, in effect. But the social contract is that these bacteria will produce the nutrients, all the other bits and pieces, and the, and the basics to produce energy within the body, provided that we provide to them a diverse and nutritious diet. So if we meet that part of it, they will meet their part of it. So it's a no-brainer that we need to eat nutritious food but research is, um, is very clear that if we eat fast food on a regular basis, then our energy levels will drop. A lot of the bacteria that we need to produce what our body needs will die off, and some of the bacteria that the body doesn't really need more of will multiply. So after about a week of eating McDonald's, for example, energy levels drop significantly, to the point that people would describe themselves as being lethargic as a consequence of that. So eating nutritious food, no brain obviously, is a key to, to having energy and to maintaining optimum energy levels. Again, a no brainer. We're, the majority of our, our organism is water, so we need to keep our water levels up. And at extremes of dehydration, our energy levels clearly drop to above the zero. And so we need to keep ourselves well hydrated. So, pretty straightforward with that. Third one is exercising regularly. We have three mechanisms within the body for, for producing energy. One of those is the storage of ATP, which is the essential building block for creating energy within the cells. And we store about, or well, the average athlete stores about 285 grams of ATP in the body which they will burn up in a few seconds once they start to do something. And then we have a, a very quick solution, which is called ATP-CP, which can convert another chemical into ATP very quickly, and that provides us about 10 seconds of energy. So that energy producing mechanism will give us the burst of energy that we need to start with. And by exercise, we can improve that that ability. Uh, the second mechanism, um, in fact the main mechanism I should, I should say, is the one that converts carbohydrates, fats and proteins into ATP. And that takes place within cells themselves and it's quite a complex process, but it's um, an aerobic process. So we need a good oxygen supply into the bloodstream to do that. 
So that's why aerobic exercise is important, that allows that oxygen supply necessary for this. So exercise allows us to, to do the, improve the amount of, of ATP that we store, the amount of ATP that we can convert quickly, and the amount of ATP that we use in the, in, over the long term. So exercise improves our availability of energy by those, those three mechanisms. Then the fourth, and I put this in brackets, is fasting intermittently. And I put it in brackets because the, the research is still ambiguous at the moment. But we were, built, we were most of human history, we were hunter-gatherers, where food supply would be intermittent, but therefore there would be times when we would fast by necessity, and there are times when we'd have plenty of food, again, by, by chance. So it seems as though we're built to fast. And there's a seminal set of experiments in, in 1946 that showed that if, if rats, still rats, fasted every third day, then their lifespan was increased by 20% for male rats and 15% for female rats. And they're rats, obviously, not humans. But subsequent research on humans suggests that fasting increases energy levels. It also increases cell production. In fact, fasting will increase the number of neurons we've got. So potentially our memory and our intelligence grows through fasting. And a number of other benefits to fasting in terms of increasing energy. So my own experience of this is that if you do fast intermittently, then energy levels do go up. So it is it's certainly a potential way of increasing energy. And then the last on the health side is sleep well. Now these first four are all choices. We can choose to eat nutritious food. We can choose to be well hydrated, and we would, we would all like to sleep well, but it's not something we can necessarily choose. So although it's, I put it here, amongst health, as we'll see, it is affected by other things um, other than our choice that we want to, we want to sleep well. So with the person next to you, just want to discuss what are the, what are the five things that underpin our energy levels in terms of our own health. Think about what what questions or clarifications you might have before we pass on to the next video, which is on the moon. I'm Clara, Sorry. Sounds like a yeah. silly question. <laughs> but it's a serious question. It's affected, well, it's affected by yeah. everything yeah. in there. Yeah. 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 Very good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> exercise. Sleep well, I find it easy. Like, I never struggle to get to sleep. Well. So let's come back to the whole group again. So any questions or clarifications around the health aspects of maintaining our energy? Any questions? Um, how much water should we drink? Because I feel like I've been here on two liters a day and it's debunked and it varies a lot. Uh, it, it depends on our, our body mass, obviously. So for somebody of my size and shape, 2.4 liters a day is, is the recommended amount. 
I probably drink close to that. But certainly I drink that on days when I do regular exercise. And you can check by the colour of your urine. And it always seems to work at that, at that level. So two litres a day is sort of debunked as a, as a benchmark. But it seems to be around that amount. So based on your body mass and so on. We were just talking about fasting and what actually constitutes fasting. Yeah. So in effect, we, we all fast overnight because we, we eat an evening meal, we digest it, then essentially we are fasting. And in fact, breakfast is called breakfast because we break the fast. And in fact, breakfast is seen as the most important meal of the day which we generally interpret means it's because it's the first meal in the day. In fact, it's the most important because it is the meal that breaks the fast. And that's the best opportunity for you to manage the flora and fauna in your gut. Because if you eat really nutritious foods at break fast, then that will shape your intestinal culture. So people who sort of fast, they would fast 24 hours or they fast from dinner to lunch or dinner to dinner it tends to be the sort of habit to be What about um, <coughs> sorry, having a massive meal half an hour before you go to bed? Does that affect that sort of uh, sort of effect in itself? Well obviously it would take longer to, um, to digest. Which are not good for our energy levels and are not good for, for, for long term health in fact. So do you want, just for the person next to you, just share a time when you were operating in the blue zone, you felt confident, <coughs> positive and creative, and then something happened, somebody came up and judged you, for example, or something else happened that caused you to drop into the red zone. So just share an experience when this took place. <laughs> Okay, so let's come back to the whole group again. So when the red zone triggers, we no longer have access to the more advanced parts of the, the, of the brain. So we become self-centered, typically pessimistic, uh, non-creative. So when the red zone is triggered, not only do our energy levels drop, but we're also unable to do complex tasks. We still do simple tasks, but not complex ones. So a way to manage our energy is to manage down the red zone. And some of the ways that we can do to achieve this is meditation is a way to do this. So meditating on a regular basis is a way that people use to manage down the red zone. So to quieten it down at least for the period of meditation <coughs> shortly after meditation. And mindfulness is becoming an important thing that people are doing. And mindfulness is about saying, 
let's stop stressing about what has occurred and let's stop being anxious about what might occur and let's just stay in the moment. Let's be mindful of what we're doing now. And that again has the, uh, has the opportunity of, of, of quieting down the red zone. And then the third strategy, I suppose, is called reframing, which of all the strategies for managing the red zone is, is the one that has the most benefit. And reframing is about using our cognitive processes to be able to think differently about the situation we're in. So if somebody comes up to us and says some, some um, harsh judgment of us, which has put us into the red zone, we can reframe that by saying, this is just a person, obviously, not having a very good day, they said this to me, but actually it's not, it's not that important in the grand scheme of things. So I've reframed what was a painful judgment of me into something which is less so. And by using the, we can do that in the advanced part of the brain, so we're re-triggering the front part of the brain, we're shifting oxygen and nutrients back into the advanced part of the brain. So reframing is also an effective way to be able to quieten down the red zone when it occurs. Now all of this assumes that we are operating in the left hemisphere. So if we look at mood then from a right hemisphere perspective, then we trigger the right hemisphere by using sustained attention. Again, another of the five forms of attention that we can apply. And the right hemisphere is able to modulate the subcortical regions of the brain which means that it can manage the fight-flight mechanisms, it can manage the amygdala, and so something can occur, and the right hemisphere can say, oh, somebody's just given a harsh judgment. Oh, that's interesting. What am I going to do next? So there's no drop down into the, into the red zone. There's no red zone effect in the right hemisphere. So we're able to stay confident, collaborative, and creative, independently of what's going on around us. So in the long run, operating in the right hemisphere. As we saw last week in terms of attention, is really a, a key way of um, being personally productive. So again, in, just in your pairs, just want to um, clarify your understanding of the difference between the left hemisphere's response to events and the right hemisphere's response to events. Go. Okay, let's bring that back to the whole group. So any questions or clarifications around? Just in terms of the right hemisphere, can you explain a little more just um, the role of it in mood? So like the, with the left, there's like blue is positive, I'm thinking good about myself, like red is bad, but you said it can modulate the region, but is there a, is there a negative aspect to the right? Um, not really, no. And it's, it's, a, it's only come about this way, because normally for humans, it's the right hemisphere that triggers as a first response to things. That's normal. Split, split brain animals in general, it's normal for the right hemisphere to trigger, because it has all of these benefits to it. It's just we've been all through a schooling, all been through a schooling system that was designed to shift the order of response. So that our left hemisphere triggers first. Which if you think of in, in a real dangerous world, that's a really dumb thing to do. Uh, but we can get away with it within a safe, relatively stable world. But one of the reasons these things are, are changing now is that the world's becoming less stable and less, and less safe. So really what we're trying to do is get back to the way we're designed to be. Which doesn't have much downside because it's where we're designed to be. So the benefits of the right, are they the same as the benefits of the left? Or yeah, remember, benefits? all we're doing is, is the first response. That's the only difference here. Research over the last, I guess, 30 years into the brain, originally neuroscientists wanted to assign to different parts of the brain different functions. But in fact, there are only two parts of the brain which are actually have specific functions that, that, are, that are unit, that are to one side rather than the other side. One is the language centre in the, 
when the pipe ran, and the centre and the centre close to that, which is manipulation. But otherwise, everything else is processed everywhere within the brain. So the issue is simply about which hemisphere responds first. That which can modulate those subcortical regions, or the fight flight system, or the part that can't. And we've all been trained to respond to the part that can't. Hence, we're either doing well or I'm feeling pretty crappy about things. What are effective ways of retraining ourselves to change our first response? Yeah. Um, listening, sustained listening. So I stumbled across this, I think I just explained last week, because I was doing a lot of coaching, and coaching uses sustained listening if you're doing it well. And after a while, I realised that there were things changing in me, that is, my anxiety levels were dropping, and I, and I couldn't really understand why until I started investigating and saw this. And I thought, okay, well, why don't I use sustained listening for more things? And so I started listening to people when they were speaking, using sustained attention, going to presentations and using sustained attention. And then realized a few years ago that in fact, now my right hemisphere was, was triggering as a matter of course and not the left. So it was just sustained, sustained, sustained attention <laughs> over, over time. So if you can feel yourself going, um, I don't know if it's personally about going down the left hemisphere track, can you bring yourself back to yeah. go, you know, I want the right hemisphere to trigger? Yeah, you can. And so if you were the person and they're saying something, you shift your attention to them, yeah. particularly look into their eyes. Eyes trigger the right hemisphere and mouth triggers the left hemisphere. Yeah. Okay. So shift your attention onto them. The thing is you want, you want to stop your conscious mind from, from saying or doing anything. So you, you want to get your attention away from it. Align my answers, and I'm asking someone, or I'm trying to persuade someone who's going. <laughs> uh, what's the mechanism there? Because they they may be listening with their left brain, which is going rashly, that, that does not make any sense, and yet my gut may be saying, well, actually, are we persuaded by our left brain or by our right brain? Um, well, it depends. So, so the Example you give, so you have an intuition. If you want to convince somebody else, you need to articulate that intuition. So you need to go through the process of articulating it. So extracting it out into a form that, that, that other people can use, which is typically a model, case studies, metaphors, and stories that explain this, this key point you want to make which is that your, your gut feel that we should do this. And that takes effort. But if you go through that effort, you're more likely to persuade the other person. You know, I think we should do this because my gut says we should. So are those three things there to say, if you do those things on an ongoing basis, you find that easier to do? Is that what that uh, Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So you can self-coach and you can get people to coach you, and so you can coach others as well. So, so, you know, so like in the moment when you're trying to access that idea that's somewhere there, those things, they're more of a longer term thing, so what do you do in the moment? You talked earlier really about downsides of the right hemisphere. Yeah. I suppose one of the downsides is it takes a while for it to know something. Yeah. And so you can feel that what we're doing isn't right if you don't yet know what it is that is right, it's just because you, it's still unformed. And often it can take five or six weeks from you feeling we should be doing something different from what we're doing to you being able to extract it and be really clear about it. There doesn't seem to be any short cut to that. It, it just takes that amount of time. Idea. Went on with brain work and the track line and everything, and then 
a week ago, I just looked at the corner and went, I know what I want to do now. And it's going to take three months to do it. But I parked the idea. I didn't stress about it because I wasn't getting angry with it. I let a couple of weeks, or I think it was almost a month, went by. And then I just was sitting there eating dinner and I looked through the window and I just, I know. Yeah. An excellent and illustration of it. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. You can't shortcut the right hemisphere to process it, and in its own good time, it'll suddenly appear to you, and it'll be obvious. Well, yeah, of course. What else would you do in that, in that corner? No. So the point of departure for this whole series of talks was around how, in modern life, we have enormous amounts of information, um, and we're not really, we haven't really evolved to deal with it. Um, Based on that, based on the, the increasing acceleration for which we are required to produce things, make decisions, communicate, um, how do we deal with that, given that we're saying that, okay, the right hemisphere can take a very long time, and yet the client may be, may be asking for the solution to the complex problems next week or even this afternoon? Well, there are two ways of solving a problem. One is you've seen this problem before which is a great left hemisphere way. Left hemisphere categorizes the various things. I've seen this problem before, therefore here's a solution to it. And that's, lots of problems are solved that way. And that's perfectly legitimate. We've done it before, so we'll do it now. The right hemisphere comes in when you've got a problem that you haven't solved before, and there's no shortcut to solving a problem you haven't solved before in two hours. You do have to go through, through the work. However, by bringing a number of people together, you can, you can accelerate the process because you'll get uh, partially formed new ideas coming in, which might have taken you two weeks to form yourself, but now they're coming in from somebody else. So you can definitely speed it up by bringing different people together in an environment which is, which is purely right hemisphere, because everybody feels included and listened to, etc. So we good? So let's just um, summarize that. So if we want to manage our energy well, then we can do so through our, our managing our health. And we have choice of a, of a food, hydration, exercise, resting. And if we manage our mood well, then we'll manage our sleep. It's the chemicals flushing around in our bodies, it's our red zone being too often triggered. It is often the cause of a broken sleep. Waking up at four o'clock in the morning suddenly and we need to do something is a, is a red zone response. In terms of mood, most of us operate, as we've been trained to do, with the left hemisphere as the first responder. And when that's the case, we have blue zone, red zone. But to manage that meditation, mindfulness, and reframing of situations are the keys to that. But the long-term solution is to use sustained attention to actually shift the balance response. So it's our right hemisphere that responds first. And then naturally, anxiety and worry and stress will, will quiet themselves down. So it's a matter of course. And then thirdly, a key area to unleash energy. As John Wright said, there are lots and lots of things coming into, into us from all directions. So when we're really clear about what it is that we should be focusing our attention on, then we'll align the left and right hemispheres. Gives us a, a boost in short-term energy to allow us to get stuff started, and then energy over a longer term to be able to complete all that over time. So finally, if you just want to go in twos or threes, just reflect on the three areas that we can use to manage our energy. What final questions or clarifications you've got, and then we'll answer those questions and then we can just reply. So, go ahead. Yeah. So let's bring that back to the whole group. So any final questions, clarifications, or comments around managing our energy as an important component of our personal productivity? Self-coaching. Um, can you talk about how that's best done? Mm. 
Yeah, so to self-coach, the, the key is to have a process that allows you to, to properly reflect on the things that you need to reflect upon, to allow the things for which you're spending more time and attention will be worthwhile, and finally, out of that arising an overarching goal that you can move towards. So it's the process that, that you need, and some discipline to follow the process. Is the, is the main thing. That if somebody else coaches you, simply because they can push you beyond where you might yourself go. Uh, but self coaching is certainly adequate as well. Final question? In fact, I don't meditate at all because I use suspended attention. As I said, meditation is about managing down the red zone. And that's not something I, I need to do these days. So I don't. Uh, but many people do, and a daily basis seems to be seems to be the idea, even if it's just ten minutes. To set up the day. Well, thank you all for your time, attention, and energy today. And uh, good luck in putting all of this into, into your thoughts and practice. <laughs>